Hi, everybody. My name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals. To learn more about it, you can go to teachthegeek.com. I have a public speaking course on there called Teach the Geek to Speak. Today, my guest is environmental engineer, Dr. Tracy Finara. Uh, she took her love of science in the lab to in front of the camera. In addition to being the manager of the environmental health research program at the Moat Marine Laboratory, she's been featured on shows such as Myth Mythbusters, The Search, and Ex The Search, and Exploration Awesome Planet. Her current venture, Inspector Planet, provides environmental education to people of all ages. Welcome to Teach the Geek Interviews, Tracy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So where exactly did your interest in science come from? That's a really good question. Uh, ever since I was little, I've loved animals. And, and the, first, the first challenge that I had in kindergarten was the invention convention. It's kind of like a science fair. And I just kept on winning them. And you know when you're good at something, uh, you kind of fall in love with it and you keep on going. But when I trace my, my love for the environment back to a certain point, it's definitely when I learned about Love Canal. I was in fourth grade and even though Love Canal happened well before my time, I, I realized, it, so Love Canal was a hazardous waste dumping site. Industries were dumping hazardous waste. Those toxins were getting into the soil and groundwater and moving. And then people started building houses and schools and parks and there were long-term health effects and cancer clusters. And although I wasn't affected, my friend's parents were. And, and my best friend's mom had MS at like 28 years old. And I just realized the connection between our impact to the environment and our health. And uh, that's really, I think, what, what inspired me to stick with environmental engineering. Okay. And then I mentioned in the intro that you're also a doctor, so you have a PhD. What, decide, what made you decide to go for your, your doctorate? So I always kind of wanted to get a doctorate. However, when I graduated from undergrad, I just wanted to make money. You know, <laughs> broke for so many years and school was really hard. I did a five-year engineering program in three years. So it was just really, really, it was a lot. And I was ready to go on into the real world. And I'm so glad that I did because honestly, if I went right from undergrad to my master's or PhD, I, I would have studied wastewater biology and looked at genetically engineering microbes to clean wastewater better. And that's not where I am now at all. After being in the field, I realized how important stormwater was and how much lack in education and, and even regulation there is for stormwater quality. So that's why I went back to school. I started to see in land development, I was a project engineer for a land development company. And I saw how everything was being done the same way over and over again. And just preventing from flooding, not really looking at the quality. And so I went back to school to prove that there was a better way. And so my master's, I was a storm chaser and I, I did some pollutant transport modeling and, and treatment of stormwater uh, through a filter media for low impact design development. And then for my PhD, I wanted to take a more holistic watershed scale approach. So I wanted to look at hydrologic restoration. So taking an urban environment and making it hydrologically look like pre-development conditions. So when you look at the water, the groundwater and the surface water, it kind of looks like it would pre before anything was built. Um, so that's, that's what I did my, my research on. And my position at Moat is completely different. And I'll probably, I'll just let you ask the next question because I can go on and on. So how long did you work in industry before you went back to school? I worked for about four years. And then while I was doing my, my master's, I was funded through the project that I was working on before my PhD, because I wanted to, I wanted to formulate my own research goals. And um, I did have a fellowship teaching seventh grade science, which was the hardest job I've ever had. Um, however, I worked uh, as a project engineer throughout my, my doctorate research as well. Um, so I was with Wilson Miller, uh, Malcolm Perney, and then C.H. Toom Hill in Gainesville during my, my PhD. Oh, wow. I, that's, that's interesting. At least 
for the most of the people that I know that have ever done PhDs, it was a full-time thing. They had to quit their jobs or if they had a job, they had to quit it and do the PhD full-time or, or people that unlike you that just went to graduate school right after undergrad. So how was, what was it like balancing working and doing a PhD at the same time? Not easy, not easy at all. The good thing is that because I did design and develop my, my PhD research, I, I focused on modeling. So it wasn't a lot of laboratory and field work. It was a lot of intensive modeling using what I did for my master's research, that field work and laboratory data, uh, using that for my PhD uh, watershed scale model. So I was able to work nights and weekends in addition to working during the day at an engineering firm. So it was really difficult, but it was now looking back, it, I mean, the stress that I had then is nothing compared to what I have now. So it's it's just funny to, to look back and think how hard I thought my life was. And then actually dealing with, with real world problems with um, issues that are, are affecting public health like Florida red tide. With, well, the, at least the majority of PhDs that I know, when they start off going down that path, their goal eventually is to stay in academia and be a professor. Was that ever your goal or did you always plan on going back into history? Yeah, so, well, right now I'm at Moat Marine Laboratory, which is a research institute. So basically, it's kind of like being in academia, except I don't have to teach. However, I choose to teach. I actually teach a sustainability class at UMass Amherst online. Um, but so it is still research focused, and it would allow me to go back into academia if I wanted to. Now, a lot of PhDs will tell you, and a lot of academia uh, employees will tell you if you go into the industry like consulting engineering after you get your PhD and try to go back it's very difficult uh, however um, with with my industry experience before my PhD along with that research experiment experience it really gave me um, a lot of options upon graduation oh, yeah it, it certainly sounds like it so would you ever consider going back and getting, I guess, a tenure track position at a, at a university or are you kind of happy where you're at? I think I would. Um, it would have to be the right position. And also, you know, to get tenure, it's, it's so intense. And that, that kind of worried me because as a, as a female, you need to start a family at some point and it's very difficult to be in that first five years when you're, when you're trying to start a family or have a personal life. But I look back at the past three years of being at Moat and I might, may as well have been trying to get tenure at a university because it's been so intense here as well. So hopefully my experience here would transfer over to any academic, academic position. However, um, I'm, I'm not sure. So I would, I would consider academia in the future, of course, um, especially with the University of Florida, since, you know, I got all three degrees there. Why not keep on going? Um, you know, I, I just thought of a question just now. So at least the, the, a lot of the people that I know that ended up getting graduate degrees, they, I guess the advice that they got is that you should get a degree from a different school that you got your, your undergrad from. Did you purposely yeah. go to all three schools that uh, go do all your three programs at the same school? Did you ever consider going elsewhere to do your graduate program? No, it's re it's really funny that you asked that because I was just talking about that earlier. It's actually very much encouraged to change schools between degrees, and and I didn't. And the reason why I didn't was because I I really felt that the university of Florida environmental engineering program was just such a great program and you know you trust the professors you like the professors you want to stick with with what you know however um, the only and when I graduated they're like well it's going to be near impossible for you to get a, a job here and uh, they actually came back and said actually no it's not because you did make up your own research for your PhD and you were pretty much unsupervised uh, which apparently was my saving grace, something that, that wasn't expected ended up being a good thing. And hopefully that would, that would save me from being, you know, rejected because I got my degree. But it is encouraged to go to different schools. Yeah, for sure. At least that's, the, that's what I've always heard. Mm -hmm. but what is, what is your, your job at, at Moat? What exactly do you do there? 
So my job at Moat, and it's, it's funny because the reason why I took the job at Moat, you know, I, I'm at a marine research institute and I had historically been working on a lot of land and freshwater bodies. Um, but at Moat, this position was open that not only was a challenge to deal with a way bigger body of water, but also had an education component. And throughout school, I realized how important it was to, to bridge the gap between the general public and scientists. Uh, I realized my friends were throwing garbage out their car window, and I would ask them where they thought it was going. And most of the time, they either didn't know or thought it went to a wastewater treatment plant when every single drop of water that lands on the state of Florida goes to a natural water body. And I realized that upon educating them, their behaviors changed. It's like there's something to that. So when I saw an opportunity to do both, which is very rare, I wanted to take it. Little did I know it just means that you're working two full-time jobs. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's really great. Um, historically, the program has been, has been uh, funded by Florida Red Tide Research. And, and it's a microscopic algae. It's a phytoplankton. Now we get 70% of our oxygen from phytoplankton, but one to 2% of those phytoplankton are harmful. And Florida red tide is one of those species. And the toxin that's released not only harms aquatic life, but it can also aerosolize, meaning that it attaches onto sea salt particles. And when winds come in, moving those particles onshore, it causes respiratory irritation in healthy individuals, but for those with asthma or COPD, this can be very serious. And that's kind of how I got attached to this, is that human component, how, it, how the environment was affecting people. Now, the challenge, and as an engineer, you always want to, you're focused on fixing the problems. You know, you don't care, you know, the scientists do all that monitoring and testing, and you just take that information and solve the problem. Florida red tide, it's a little bit different because these blooms have been happening since anecdotally we have reports from the 1500s. So it is a native species and the blooms are naturally occurring. However, if the blooms get close enough to shore to use surface water nutrients to sustain or even exacerbate, they may. And so that's where the possible human component comes in and, and that's where my expertise in stormwater design and low impact development comes in. Uh, which is kind of cool that that I'm ended up in a place where where my expertise and this this new position is is combining and finally like coming together, which is pretty neat. Yeah, that, that does sound pretty interesting. So I mean, you, you, you mentioned that essentially you're working two jobs, and I guess you know one of those jobs is being able to communicate the the, the science that you work on to to others that aren't as as knowledgeable as as you are on the science. Where did that interest in, in being a science communicator come from? It, you know, my interest in science communication really came from just realizing how education can change behaviors to lead to a more sustainable earth. Um, and, and seeing just the difference between what the general public knows and, and even what I knew going through school, there was just such a gap and I, and I knew that just informing people and just letting people know you know, if you ask a, a, the person next to you where the water comes from or where it goes when they flush the toilet, nine times out of 10, they have no idea. Um, and so just being aware and inspiring that, that curiosity to find out how the world works, how, how society functions, um, will just change behaviors and, you know, water conservation and water quality, fertilizer use, pesticide use, you know, all of that will come together with advanced education and science communication is, is one way to do that. You know, I mentioned in the intro that you founded Inspector Planet. What exactly is Inspector Planet? That's a really good question. I'm trying to find that out right now. So <laughs> Inspector Planet was, was my alias at first. It was just, you know, I was going to make a website because I wanted to have a public outreach section or chapter for my dissertation that actually got thrown out because we, my advisor wanted me to stick to the hard science, which long, long run, it was the right decision. However, for this chapter that got thrown out, I wanted to make a website and start making educational videos. And so that's, that's what 
Inspector Planet originated as. It was just an alias for me going out into the world and showing the public how the world works. Uh, but now it's a website and almost uh, a mission for science communication and for citizen science for anybody to be a scientist or an engineer by just by just helping, uh, being educated, making, you know, informing their friends and other people and taking a part in science. We have a number of citizen science projects uh, at Mount Marine Laboratory even that we inspire our citizens to or encourage our citizens to take part in, um, not only for data collection, but also education and to empower the public. One question that, so, a few months ago, earlier this year, I was a, a moderator of a panel, and the panel was on science advocacy. It was about a month before the March for Science. Are you are you familiar with March for Science? Yes. Okay, so we had a, a mod, we did a moderated panel, and I, I one of the questions I asked the the panelists was, you know, science communication is very important. I I mean, I find science communication is very important, and right. and kids are naturally inquisitive, so. So a lot of kids that have this interest in science, but it seems like as some people grow up, perhaps their beliefs outside of science can be in conflict with science. So you might have a kid who has this interest in science, but his parents or his or her parents, because of their belief system, there are certain things that, you know, you talk about science and they're not, they, they're, they're, they conflict their beliefs and, and, and science. So as a science communicator, do you have any thoughts on, on how you can, I guess, address or, or deal with people whose beliefs are in, in contrast to what science says? Yeah, and actually this is one of my passions. I grew up Catholic, um, so I, I understand, and I've never, I, personally, I've never seen the conflict. I've never seen the problem. To me, they were all simultaneously. There was one that was a, a, a book of stories that explained, you know, the, the human perception of what the science was. To me, there has always been this intersection between science and religion. So that's one of my, I actually made a pilot um, on this to do a show showing uh, the intersection between history, culture, science, and religion. Um, because there are so many, for example, sinkholes or, or hurricane events. You know, it, and the question is, are, was the Bible, for example, as one of the options for religion? Because we are finding in doing that research that a lot of the religions, they do have similar stories about, you know, the river of sticks for sinkholes, for example. But the sinkholes are mentioned in the Bible quite a few times. So the question is, is that a prophecy or is it, you know, the way the world works, like in a cycle, um, you know, and that's that's kind of the question that that we're posing for the audience in this in this idea for for a TV show. Um, but there, to me, I've never had a problem with you know being Catholic and being a scientist. So it's really interesting to me that it has become so polarized and so divisive. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I remember asking the, the panelists that question, and essentially their answer was, "You don't." Some people, their their beliefs are so ingrained that you really it's 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 near impossible for anything to kind of break through that. So it's great to hear that someone like yourself, who identifies as a Catholic, can still see the the importance of science and, or the the validity of, of science. You know? Right, and that now when it comes to climate change, that's really interesting to me because I really don't see anywhere that that conflicts. You know, I, I mean, it's pretty much, yes, it's a cycle, but we are enhancing that cycle. Where the religion comes into that is, is a question that, that I would have for, for other people that see that as a, as a religious threshold. For sure. So I mentioned also in the intro that you've been on a couple of shows. So this Mythbusters, The Search, what was that show about? What was your affiliation with it? So Mythbusters is a show that that was on for 16 years. It had um, two main hosts and three builders, and they basically tested myths. They had a question. They built something to test whatever myth they were going to test, and then and then they did that. So this show, Mythbusters: The Search, was a spinoff from the original to find new hosts. So I was one of the potential new hosts. So basically, we did exactly what they did in the show. We had. For example, uh, can you find a needle in the haystack? 
Um, does deflate gait, does, do deflated balls actually enhance uh, athletic ability on a football field? Um, what's another one? Can you paint a room with C4? Um, things like that. So it was a lot of fun. We got to, it actually, what I love about this, you know, the, these experiments weren't done with max optimization. You know, they weren't, you know, approached always the, the best scientific way, way possible. But what Mythbusters does is it reaches a demographic that normally wouldn't be reached with science, it, which is really cool because people don't even realize that it's a science show um, because there's a lot of explosions, there's a lot of excitement, um, and that's what they're, they're watching it for, which is pretty awesome. So, and with, oh, sorry. Oh, no, please go continue. Oh, I was going to say with Awesome Planet, I'm a guest expert on um, on an episode. It's hosted by Philippe Cousteau. Okay. And on Animal Outtakes, I have an animal myth segment where I'm, you know, busting animal myths. Uh, but hopefully um, in the future, I will have an opportunity to have my own my own show. So we'll see what happens, though. You know, these things, it's almost like a lottery ticket. So. It's, it's, it's interesting. It was something that you said that sparked this next question. So you mentioned that the show was meant to appeal to people who would be difficult to, to reach in, in terms of science. Do you think that those people, when they're watching the show, can accept or even realize that, they're, that there's even science of, in, in incorporated into the show? Or are they just kind of fixated on the explosions? That's a really good question. Um, and I've always thought that even if they don't realize that it's science, they're, they're subconsciously taking in some of those concepts. Um, th that's the hope at least, but I am an optimist. Um, so, so that's a, that's a really good question that you pose. So, and then the other show I think you, you mentioned was, ex or I mentioned was Exploration Awesome Planet. What was that? Right. And how was your affiliation with that? So for that, I, I am on there talking about red tide and our use of biofiltration to remove biotoxins. So we, had the, we have these structures called living docks. Basically, they're structures that, that are colonized with um, bivalves like mollusks and uh, like clams, oysters, filter feeders, basically. And we know that these filter feeders accumulate the toxin from Florida red tide, um, so they're removing them from the water column. So we were testing how these filter feeders or these living dock structures can alleviate some of those effects of Florida red tide. Hmm, interesting. And your, I guess the, the shows that you were on, is, has being on, on TV always been a, an interest of yours or is this, these kind of opportunities that you kind of fell into your lap? So when I was little, it's funny because I didn't realize this. And then my mom sent me uh, something I wrote when I was eight and then nine and 10. And apparently being an actress was like, being an actress or a veterinarian, those were my, <laughs> my two things. So I'm kind of doing both. I'm a scientist and I, I have done some TV, but um, it's interesting because I, it, wasn't, it wasn't a goal of mine until, uh, until I was working on my PhD and I really did see that gap between the general public and science. And, um, and I was like, well, the easiest way to fill that is to be on a platform where you reach the most amount of people. Doing these presentations is great, but you meet, reach 50 to 100 each time, and it takes a lot of time. Um, reaching hundreds of thousands at a time is, is a little bit more time effective. For sure. And so the, the fact that you're, you're big on, on science communication and you, you know, you've done these, a couple of you know, these TV shows, you must be pretty proficient at public speaking. And if not, what have you done to, to improve in, in public speaking? So I've had to do a lot of improvement, uh, a lot of improvement. And the thing is, like, it's, it's pretty funny because I didn't realize how much, how much I needed to grow from, from where I started. And I look back to where I started, and I was really hesitant. And when I would talk, start talking about science, the energy would just like go down. Um, so over time, that's what I've really worked on. And the best thing for me to get better has been watching things that I've done over again and then doing them over and seeing, trying to find out the right energy level, the right way to say things, things that, 
you notice about your on-camera personality that are likable, things that aren't, um, and and trying just trying to get better, trying to um, build off of those past experiences over and over. And I have so much improvement to still do. Um, I am not perfect or refined by any means, but it's part of my likability. No, I'm just kidding. But but no, I have <laughs> I do have a long way to go, um, and I'm really grateful for the opportunities that I've had that have helped me grow. Um, unfortunately, this whole uh, red tide um, issue in Florida has become such a big deal that uh, that I have been required to do so much public speaking in the past four months. Uh, and I say unfortunately because that means that it is affecting people pretty um, severely the past the past four to five months, um, even though this bloom has been around for a year. Um, but but if I want to see the silver lining, it has given me opportunities to speak and to get better at, at speaking. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I think your, 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 your tip on, on watching yourself after the fact, I think it's a, it's an excellent tip to, to get better because you, you know, when you, when you're in it, you're, you're, there's a lot of things I'm sure that you don't notice. And then when you look, when you're able to look at yourself, you know, after the fact, especially if you give yourself a little bit of time, there's, there's, you notice a lot of things that, that you wouldn't have noticed in the moment. And, and not only that, but there is no such thing as, as perfection. You know, right. practice, practice makes progress. So we're always getting, you know, there's always something that, that you can, that you can improve on for sure. So when it comes to the, the public speaking that you do, do you ever get nervous? And, and if so, how do you get past your nerves? Every single time, no matter how many times I speak, I get nervous. No matter, it's crazy. It's, it's absolutely shocking. And I start hyperventilating. Um, and, and so at first, I didn't really understand why this was happening. So I would say, I'm sorry, I'm really nervous. I get nervous every time and I don't know why. And then I would be fine. Um, but someone told me that there's a scientific or a physiological way to prevent that from happening. And that's just by taking deep breaths and counting. So that's what I started to do right before I speak. I just take, I take like five deep breaths slowly and all the nerves go away. It's, it's the craziest thing. Um, so sometimes it creeps back up while I'm talking, but, but very rarely. So that really helps is breathing. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you. It's, it's also something that I do. Oh, you know, deep breaths from the diaphragm definitely help in, in calming your nerves. So I, I fully agree with you there. And you know, now that I, I'm, I'm thinking about it, oh, geez, what was it? oh, well, I forgot what I was gonna say, but I'll, I'll move on to the next question, I guess. So when it comes to you uh, giving, you know, do, doing public speaking in front of people, do you have a process for how you, how you practice your, your, your presentations? Yeah, you know, I, I've had so, honestly, I, I'm being dead honest, I, I, I wish I can, I can answer that question, but for me, I've had so many presentations that they're all kind of practice even though they're the, you know, the, the recital, there's, they've become practice because there's no time in between because I do have to do my research and my, my actual job. And then I do that outside um, stuff too. So, so as far as my presentations go, uh, at first, you know what? At first I was recording myself and watching them over finding out what areas didn't make sense and, and that I tripped over. So I can't say that I don't practice because the, I, I really did use, I did that for a while, um, recorded it and then watched it back. That's probably the most helpful thing that you can do. It's the same thing that, with um, the, the video stuff. For me, the, the one thing that I do a lot is Instagram stories. So I practice speaking and I watch it back. And if it's, if it's terrible or if it doesn't make sense, um, I record it over by saying something differently. And that helps with my presentations too. And then I have a bunch of employees and interns that tell me when something doesn't make sense, which helps. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it does. I just remember what I was gonna say. So when it comes to, to being nervous, the way I look at it is, the fact that you're nervous is a, is a sign that you actually care about what you're talking about. Because if you, if you didn't care at all, I'm sure your nerves would not be as, as, as high because you wouldn't care if the audience got anything out of what you were talking about. So you're right. So the fact that you're, you're, you're nervous, is just, it's just a sign that you care. 
Yes. Yeah, it's a sign of passion. It definitely is. For sure. So is there anything else that you'd like uh, the people listening in to, to know that we haven't covered, perhaps things that you're working on? Um, so right now I'm working on a number of different things. Uh, I've just recently had a project that finished up on uh, looking at endocrine disruptors uh, from pesticides, for example. So endocrine disruptors are chemical compounds that impact your uh, hormone system, basically. So um, if you for wildlife, for example, it can cause, you know, two heads or reproductive, reproductive uh, changes. Um, it can do the same thing in humans long term. So my project in the Florida Keys was to look at the transport or where pesticides go, where they end up in the water to see if they are impacting the coral reefs. Um, but my Florida red tide research that I'm working on right now so I am in charge of developing those citizen science projects as well as technologies that get information about Florida Red Tide to the public as fast as possible. Um, in addition, because I am, you know, a, a stormwater and weather geek, uh, I implement some of that stuff into my tools as well. So I have the Beach Conditions Reporting System, which is a website, visitbeaches.org, and smartphone app uh, that allows trained beach sentinels to report beach conditions that anyone would want to know going to a beach, including red tide effects, respiratory irritation, and dead fish. Um, we also have Seasick, which is a citizen science reporting app, which reports, you know, weather, inland conditions, odors, wildlife fatalities, things like that, that, that anybody can report on and then see those reports on a map. We also have a NASA funded project uh, that we are contracted on by NOAA and GCUS, where we train citizen scientists to take a cell phone microscope like this out to the water, take a sample of water, put it underneath the microscope, upload a 30 second video into an app that has an algorithm that automatically calculates the concentration of red tide by its shape, size, and movement. That information automatically goes to a NOAA respiratory irritation model. The reason why this is so amazing is not only because it's a citizen science project, but also because something that used to take someone in the lab counting cells on a counter underneath a microscope, you know, a day to do 16 samples takes our volunteers five minutes. So this is a huge improvement if this is vetted and, and works the way that we, we believe it, it will and does. Um, this will be a huge advancement in red tide detection technology. Wow, sounds like you got a lot of stuff going on. Yes. In addition, we're working on mitigation strategies for Florida red tide, and I'm working on a proposal to do a statewide stormwater model to determine nutrient loading at various locations and how we can improve or lessen that nutrient loading. Excellent. Well, this has been definitely an education. Thank you for, for being a guest on the channel, Tracy. How can people contact you? Uh, they can find me by looking for Inspector Planet or email me at tfinara at moat.org. Excellent. Well, everybody, that marks the end of another episode of Teach the Geek interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals. The first offering of the platform is a public speaking course, and it's called Teach the Geek to Speak. To learn more about that, you can go to teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Until next time, please take care.